What up, what up, what up? Welcome to another episode of New Orleans Dot Basketball. As always, I'm your host, Raphael Rattler, joined by my fellow middle brother, Gary G. Mother Rattler. What's popping with you after that one? Hey, man, I told you it was cold outside and <laughs> it <laughs> transferred over to the first half. That, let me tell you something, that is one of the strangest basketball games I've ever watched in my life. Um, it, 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 I, man, that, what a win. First of all, but man, was that that a weird was that a weird game? So uh, let's get into it. Yeah, before we jump into it, make sure you guys follow us on Twitter, on IG, on X, uh, on TikTok, whatever you guys uh, follow in terms of social media. That's in no basketball, no e. Make sure you like the episode below and subscribe to the channel. So yeah, the Pelicans complete the twenty-two point deficit to open their nationally televised schedule on the year, defeating the Oklahoma City Thunder 110-106 in a game that it felt kind of like a playoff game, but like the opposite way. Like it was a bunch of like back and forth, but a lot of sloppy and a lot of bad and a lot of just kind of like uncharacteristic basketball for both teams on both sides so let's jump into it bro like what were your thoughts from the game obviously the pelicans get a win and you would much rather learn from victory than from defeat so what were your thoughts on the game altogether i i man so the the offense right so this new james borrego offense clearly has an emphasis on getting up as many threes as possible. We saw last year the Pelicans rank very low on three-point attempts, um, you know, on three-point attempts on the year, uh, but shot a pretty good percentage on those those attempts. Well, now they're letting it fly. Like, they're letting it fly. And, I mean, to start, it was mind-boggling. I tweeted about it. I was talking about it on Twitter. It just was so crazy to watch JV and Zion just kind of, like, not do anything. I'm looking at Chet, and I'm looking at – like Josh Giddy be the these big the big men for them t- the team and I'm like, well, I mean at some point you know they missed 19 straight threes before Larry Nance of all people broke the seal, and I was like, well <laughs> maybe at like 10 in a row mm-hmm. they'd be like, well maybe we should stop shooting these and going. I was like, well certainly at 13 in a row miss <laughs> they was gonna go inside. Okay, well, for sure 17 in a row. That's not a beat. And I'm like, they just kept shooting. And I'm like, well, they aren't getting they, – they they were still chipping away at the lead. So when you go into halftime, I, I tweeted, I was like, I don't know if I should tell them to stop shooting or to continue shooting because they, they found themselves down eight at half. And, you know, they came out in that second half and they decided to play Pelicans basketball the way – We've known Pelicans basketball since the Willie Green era took over, going back to summer league, the that first summer league where the first thing you saw was like these these guys are playing defense. Pels went back to playing defense. Pels went back to attacking the paint. Whatever Willie Green said at halftime worked. You know we've always talked about can Willie Green adjust on the fly? He adjusted on the fly. It, it took a while to get there, but he adjusted on the fly and JV. Uh, Zion and then CJ just came out and attacked the, the the paint relentlessly, and he chipped away and he chipped away. And before you even knew it, the Pelicans were up twelve points, and it was just you know it's just one of the strangest strangest games because you you like to think that this you know the 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 second half offense is something that the Pelicans sh- should want to go to to start off the game to set up the the three pointer, mm-hmm. but it kind of seemed like they went from let's use the three pointer to set up the inside game, which was weird. It, it just was an inverted game all the way. You started off saying, like, it was a weird game. Felt like a playoff game the opposite way. It just was a weird game overall. But like like you said at the end, the quality of win is not on the, ske- on, on, the on the schedule. It says W or L. And you walk away with a W, and that's all you can ask for. If you would have told me that Brandon Ingram, Jose Alvarado, Trey Murphy, Najee Marshall were out the game, Zion would shoot 35% from the field, and the Pelicans would shoot 39% from the field. I would probably tell you that's an L. That's a loss. Yes, a big L. A capital L. But just like we were saying to preview this show, 
The Pelicans are a team that is led by their defense. And if they come with the defensive mentality, they have the ability to guard teams unlike a lot of teams in this league, right? And so if they're able to make things difficult on you and win on the boards, which finally you saw them do, and we highlighted before him that they should do because OKC just don't got enough in the bag, right, from that perspective, they finally went on the boards, and it gives them a chance to come back. Now, in terms of, like, the three-point shooting, like, it's almost got to a point where they were just shooting threes to wait for one to go in versus, like, playing offense. Because guys who don't normally, like, Herb and Dyson, now Matt Ryan and, 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 and Jordan Hawkins, like, I expect them to shoot as soon as they touch it. But, like, Dyson and Herb were shooting threes. <laughs> not – Catch and shoot threes. It was like, that is not your game. And, like, the thing that is weird that I take away from it the most is that Jordan Hawkey, Hawkins, a rookie of all, he goes, he, he he has a terrible night from the field. But he never deterred from who he is throughout the game. Like, he's still making an impact. Like, he was sky and high for boards. He won the smallest guy on the, on, on the court, if not the smallest guy. Like, he was making a plays defensively even though his shot were not falling, whereas you had veteran guys on the court, including Zion, including CJ at times in the first half that were like, oh, we can't score, so I guess we can't do anything else on in the basketball game either, right? And so when you see that from your young players, even a Dyson Daniels who didn't really get it going offensively still can't hit a free throw to save his mm-hmm. life, but like still making plays in other ways and finding ways to contribute. And to your point, like, Larry Nance kind of set it off with his three that finally broke it, but it was his energy in the second half that the Pelicans just lacked. Like they, at some point they realized that maybe there's a different way to go about this. Right. (laughs) The first question I have for you is we highlighted this going into the game. There was no one to guard JV. First of all, why does Jonas Valanciunas fade away ever? Like, especially if you have Chet on the post, it was almost like a light bulb went off that JB was like, oh, yeah, by the way, that guy is half my size. So every time the ball goes up or I get the ball near the basket, I'm just going to go through him just like I would anybody else. Like, is that is that confusing to you? Why, like, they either don't go to JB or JB just doesn't assert himself? Yeah, yeah. Chet was fighting for his life in the second half. I, I mean, he was <laughs> it, JV decided to lean on him, and it just was like, oh, I, I there's nothing I can do. I, I it's it's just weird. It, it 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 seems as though you know JV is not like he's a for by all accounts, JV is a gentle giant, right? And you hear you know people talk about how nice of a guy he is and, and things like that. And it seems like JV needs to just like grab somebody and be like, like, first of all. <laughs> play through me, give me the ball. And then somebody needs to grab JV and tell him the same energy that you have, you know, for, you know, guys when you staring them down after they do annoy you and things like lean into people. You are bigger. We talked about this all last season. Like there's not a lot of guys that are stopping JV straight up one and one, right? Like you talk about Joel and B and things like that, but JV is a large, strong man. He is a, Basketball, too. He is a basketball deity in his country of Lithuania. He is he is a phenomenal offensive player, a phenomenal, you know, like footwork, things like that. It's just sometimes he likes to show the finesse and fade a little bit. And you know, he he decided to turn it up, and there was nothing that check could do, right? All the talent in the world, all the dribble mechanics in the world. Doesn't make up for genetics, all right. It does not make up for genetics, and you know, JV just went to it, and you know, he he was a big factor in the Pelicans taking off, and so was CJ. CJ came out and was phenomenal. He he came out. We talk about him needing to get into his bag every once in a while. Tonight was a game that he needed to get in his bag, but JV and CJ were really the bookends. This is why you have talented veterans. This is why the Pelicans, at their highest, right at when they're firing all cylinders. There's just so much talent up and down the floor. You heard Monica McNutt talk about it on on ESPN. There's just a lot of guys that you have to account for when you talk about this Pelicans team, and it it showed in different ways today. And still, majority of the guys, the rotation is not there yet. We have yet to see a fully, 
you know, put together Pelicans team uh, this season, and yet they still finding ways to blow Knicks, the Knicks out and win close games this way. So um, just a just a just a really good, resilient win for the Pelicans tonight. Sure, on the road as well in a tough environment. So a couple things that again, it's early in the season, only been four games, but you kind of want to pay attention to the Pelicans are two and zero. Oh. When they win the rebounding battle and they're two and oh when they win the third quarter. Like they came out with energy in the third quarter. To your point, from the tip, Zion himself, CJ himself, a re-emphasis of going to the lane, and obviously good things happen. So we have to talk about the big fella. So I understand it has to be hard for we have a brother who is an NCAA official. <laughs> it has to be hard to officiate a guy like Zion Williamson when like easily you could call a play. It's like an offensive lineman and defense. Like you could call a hole on every play. You could call a foul on every play that Zion touches the ball just about. And nobody wants to watch this. I get it. But on one end of the, the court, like you can kind of lean into somebody and draw the foul and it's okay. But in the other end of the court, like, Zion is just beating his head against a defender or his arms are being slashed or whatever it may be. And like, there's just nothing called from the ref. There is no like immediate wrestle or whatnot. Like that's an issue that you maybe, maybe David Griffin has to go back to the league and, and write one of those memos <laughs> and take that fine that, that, that they need to call more fouls for Zion. But like, it's a problem. But the other problem is Zion's reaction to it. His body language throughout this entire game was horrendous. You even heard through the mics on ESPN, you heard someone say, forget about it, Z. Like every play, he, I said, like he spent a lot of time with Luca in Paris and they're boys and that's this is what Luca does. Like he was just moping on plays. Like there was a play inside of a minute where Zion didn't get a call and the whole possession the Pelicans play four or five. Like, I get the frustration. I also understand that Zion is still a young guy with not a lot of playing time, a lot of frustration under his belt. But there's a balance of you're the leader. The people are going to follow as you lead. And so if you're moping up the court and you're frustrated, everybody else is going to be frustrated too. Where's the balance of the NBA having to get the refing and the officiating of Zion right, the way, same way they had to do with Shaq? Versus Zion just needs to grow up and find other ways instead of putting himself, his team at a disadvantage when he mopes back up the court. I feel like we've been having this discussion, this debate, um, these these things that we have to address uh, for a while, right? And I think, listen, it is difficult to guard Zion. It is difficult to guard Zion without following him. And it is difficult to guard Zion when you are not the same size or anywhere close to the same size as he is. So he gets fouled a lot. And I think it, you saw early in his career, he wasn't really like fighting back and fussing and arguing and doing things. And now like he has gotten to a point where it is, you know, it is an issue. And so, you know, it, it, it's tough for him, right? It, it's tough. And, you know, you hate to see him go through these these times where he's going through the motions and, and like you said, moping. And it affects the team negatively and, you know, in a very negative light. But at the same time, like, you have to grow up. You have to know that your participation on both sides of the floor is more important than trying to convince the ref to uh, circumvent and, and retroactively call a foul call. That never, ever works. And so, you know, the Pelicans could have very well lost this game had, you know, one of those plays where Zion was moping and complaining, um, had that turned into a bucket, right, with the game being as close as it is. And so, listen, it, it's tough for, for, for Z to deal with, but it's something that he has to learn to play through. He's going to see it his entire career. If he needs to, I would I would suggest calling out to Shaq, right, and, and asking Shaq how he dealt with Giannis. it. And how he dealt, and, and Giannis as well, right, and, and how they dealt, they deal with it. Um, and continue to play through it and continue to be successful because they are the barometers of, you know, hard to hard to referee and hard to, you know, hard to officiate. So it's tough. 
Um, you know, I hate to see it, but at the same time, it's understandable when you are getting thrashed every time down the floor over and over again. Um, and then you come down and you barely touch Chetty. He falls on the ground and you get called for a foul. I can understand the the, 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 the frustration, but you have to find a way to play through it because your participation is worth more than any free throw, any retroactive um, play that you think a uh, foul call that you might think might come out of it. Right. So I think uh, another reason why the office is look clunky outside of it's a new offense and there's new things um, to kind of incorporate in terms of Zion being back and things like that is that like when I say the Pelicans are a deep team, it's as they're constructed. All the pieces need to fit together like a puzzle. Whereas if you take out key pieces, the puzzle never works. Now, I'm not just talking about talent. But I'm talking about roles as well, right? Like, if you take out Brandon Ingram and Trey Murphy and Najee Marshall and Jose Alvarado, you've taken out your main initiators of offense you've taken out the main people that get to the basket and are able to contribute from that standpoint and so if you take those guys out then you leave catch and shoot players where they fall in love with the three and they're not attacking the rim even cj is more a shooter than an attacker and so in those scenarios like that's why the office looks clunky because when zion comes out and you're not being jv in the post it's almost impossible for any of those other players to consistently cause havoc at the rim and create those catch and shoot opportunities. So like, do you think that's a big of an issue? Do you think like Brandon Ingram, you know, he's supposed to come back tomorrow versus the Pistons, but do you think that Brandon Ingram and those guys being out is more of an opportunity for these other guys to grow in those other areas? Or do you just think like the office has to look different when those guys are out? I, I think it, it's a it's a mixture of both. Uh, I think this team, you know, some of these young guys, especially like Jordan Hawkins, this experience that he's getting right now will be invaluable for, you know, for the season moving forward for him. But I do think, you know, these guys that are out, they do bring a lot to the offense. Like even Najee, Najee's a creator. Like he does crazy things on the floor, but he is a creator and he can get guys moving and get guys in motion and, and, and score. And in guy, you know, Trey Murphy, is a huge part of, you know, being able to stagger these lineups. And even when you don't go to JV, like if you have Trey out there, like that's another weapon out there that can not only produce, but can help kind of open up the offense for other players. And so it's difficult when, when you remove Brandon Ingram um, and you sit Zion down and you're asking CJ and JV to kind of maintain the offense for extended periods of time, especially when the ball does, is not going to JV. And now you're asking CJ to do whatever he can. So it's, it's got, it's difficult for this team to, to kind of generate that offense. But I think what you're seeing is that they're trying to overcompensate that with, with bombing from three, right. And you saw the good and then you saw the bad and then you saw the good again uh, with, with this game uh, in, in particular. So, you know, I, I think the offense has to, has to, work yourself out but the only way to do that is to get guys on the floor to play so i think when bi comes back and especially when trey and those guys get back as they continue to work on this offense i think it'll get better uh because again you have the, the 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 weapons out there it's just about getting them together and and putting them on the floor right like i think that situations like this you saw it a little bit from kyra being aggressive and being the person that causes the attack like i think this is where he needs to kind of show his value and you kind of seeing it from game to game. So we talk about game to game tomorrow night's another night, another opportunity to put a, a, a W in the column. You're playing against the Pistons. They just lost to the trailblazers and the fight in shade and sharps. Um, <laughs> the keys to this one, like the matchup obviously is Kate Cunningham versus Brandon Ingram, who should be fresh, you know, coming off two missed games. So Cade is really the only, the main hub for them. Other than that, you have a bunch of role players. But the keys to this game have been one that's important for the Pelicans for years. Like, don't play down to your competition. The Pistons are not as talented of a team. Even the p players who play tonight for the Pelicans, like the Pistons don't match up from that standpoint. So you should play like you played in the second half versus how you played in the first quarter and things like that. What are some of the other things you're looking for out of this matchup as the Pelicans look to start a new win streak? Detroit is a physical, physical team, right? This mm -hmm. is a totally different juxtaposition of, of the OKC Thunder and the Detroit Pistons. 
Jalen Duran, Isaiah Stewart, Beef Stew, those guys will muck it up. Um, they will they will rebound um, and they will be athletic. And so the Pelicans have to, you know, be, be mindful of that and make sure that they're crashing the boards, um, make sure that they're boxing out, make sure they're getting a body on a body. Um, and, and again, be the better team, right? You have all of these aspirations. You talk about one to be, uh, uh, you know, one of the best teams in the NBA. Best, the best teams in the NBA win these games. They win the games that they're supposed to win. Um, and they do it in, yeah, at, especially at home. And they do it in a way that they play their way. So I want to see Zion turning the, uh, the, the corner, getting downhill. Um, and hopefully Brandon Ingram can come in and, and make an immediate contribution. Um, but I can't wait to see how Willie Green gets back into staggering the lineups, especially with Jordan Hawkins now kind of like he's in there, like he's part of this now. <laughs> and so, um, you know, is it? I'll be interested to see how he staggers this lineup um, and who's, whose day is it going to be tomorrow to kind of save the day and play the game. Right. Um, they got to bring the energy. They got to play up tempo. They got to move the ball. All the things they did in the second half, they need to start the game with next week or uh, tomorrow night. So with that being said, the Pelicans tip off at 7 p.m. in the Smoothie King Center. What you got left for the people, Gag? As always, you never know what people are going through. So give someone a smile today. Really freaking weird. I feel like a Twilight Zone. Should be having a Twilight Zone in the back for Twilight Zone music in the background playing because this was a crazy win. But one of the more satisfying wins to see the Pelicans kind of, uh, uh, you know, fix a, a, a big errors um, like mm-hmm. on the fly. So um, as always, follow myself at Garrick underscore Rattler. Follow my brother at Raphael underscore Rattler. Follow the page at Inno Basketball No E and subscribe to New Orleans Basketball. We'll see you guys next time.